Okay, well, thank you for this kind invita invitation. And I'm excited to present uh, my paper here. I'm so happy that you guys uh, are attending um, despite the beautiful weather. I hope we'll have um, a, a nice conversation, nice discussion after the talk. Um, uh, Diego had asked me also to make some references towards COVID-19 to connect maybe the material and the insights of this paper with um, the contemporary condition. And um, I'm, I'm trying to do this now here in the beginning because I actually think that um, the notion of interference um, and, and the attention to connectivity, which I will lay out in this paper, um, really speak well to, um, to, to our contemporary times and to the whole pandemic as such. Um, um, and I think it's, it's, um, it can help us to rethink what social life means and what being a social person uh, is. Um, so even though the paper that I'm going to present uh, was written as an immediate intervention in the study of mobile phone sociality, um, actually what I'm trying to do in the paper is trying to counter the whole hallelujah mood um, around mobile technologies and connectivity, um, I actually think, you know, the global pandemic is also the outcome of, you know, increased connectivity, maybe too much connectivity. Um, as, as we look at how the virus traveled from one country, one um, continent to the other, one social group to the other, what we're seeing is actually um, global traveling making this, this pandemic um, partly, not only, uh, but making it partly possible. So maybe we're experiencing here the dark side of globalization and globalization being characterized by a constant sense of acceleration and desire for acceleration, which, and this acceleration uh, brings uh, with it a heightened connectivity between people and between spaces. And um, I, in particular, I've been thinking about um, Apadurai's book on the fear of small numbers, in which he writes about terrorism as a dark side of globalization. Terrorism being fueled by anger and the experience of exclusion, but maybe the pandemic is another phase of this dark side of globalization. Um, COVID-19 draws our attention to too much connectivity, too much intimacy, um, which jeopardizes individuals' health and their physical survival, but also jeopardizes, as we can see on more collective levels, regional and national economies uh, because our globalized world depends to such an extent um, on, um, on this globalization and this constant interaction and interactivity and intimacy actually. So, um, so I think th these are maybe issues that we can uh, pick up again during the uh, Q&A. What I'm presenting is a paper that uh, has a very strange um, history. Um, I, I carried out the field work of it in 2015, 16, and 17, presented the paper first in 2017, um, and, then, um, got, um, and then got published in the um, journal of the space where I presented it. I presented it in Brussels here um, at the um, Royal Academy of Overseas Sciences, um, and uh, they prefer to publish the papers that are presented in their workshop. And uh, apparently the journal has some issues, some publication issues. So when in uh, late 2018, you know, they told me, yeah, it's going to be published, but it will be antedated. Uh, so it became a text published in 2016, you know, which, is, which is interesting, you know, which makes us you know, uh, think about the economy of publications um, and the temporalities of publications in a sense. Uh, maybe there's a slowing down going on with that particular journal instead of the acceleration. But what the good news is, although the journal is not that well known, it maybe mainly publishes in, in Dutch and in French, uh, although my paper is in, is in English, it is now open access. And uh, that is the link on which you can uh, find the paper. Um, and here, yes, here I've been talking about, here I've, I've, I've already mentioned this. Um, so um, what I'm trying to do uh, in this article is um, I'm trying to make a call for more analytical attention to the concept of connectivity. And um, with connectivity, 
um, I mean a particular modality of being, of being an individual, but also a society can be connected. Connectivity then means an openness for social relations with others um, and an acknowledgement of the fact that with this um, openness and the ensuing entanglements comes a particular dependence. In anthropology, we're maybe more familiar with the notion of individuality. Um, well, individuality in contrast to the indiv individual, the notion of the individual um, references this idea that we are not as autonomous or individual as we like to think, but um, we're, we're really constantly connected to others, to other places, to other times, other people. Um, these connections, these relationships really make up who we are, what we can do, our, our societal possibilities in our lives. Um, and connectivity um, is closely related to the notion of the individual. Um, so connectivity is a modality, um, uh, an openness to establish relations with visible and invisible others. And invisible others can be distant others, but can also be spiritual others, religious others. Um, and in our society, our contemporary society, what we're hearing more and more is maybe, you know, against this, this whole hype of connectivity, we, we hear more and more talking about the need of disconnection, of a reduction of that connectivity. And we can think of the social distancing that is advocated now as a strategy or a measure to preserve ourselves and, and you know, to, to allow ourselves and our communities to, to reproduce ourselves, um, to, to, be, to, to, to survive. Um, it's actually a way of managing our connectivity. Um, you, you're, we are not going to work with disconnecting uh, physically from our maybe work environment if we can stay at home. We are reducing our social contacts uh, or our connectivity, physical connectivity with others. Um, we, and these others are potentially dangerous others. My attention um, to connectivity is, um, was inspired by uh, ethnographic research that I carried out in Kinshasa before carrying out this project that I'm talking about. Um, I, in 2013 and 14, mainly, I spent a lot of time uh, in churches uh, of Christians of a group of Pentecostalism uh, called Brana. Uh, so Branhamism, Pentecostalism, is a brand of Pentecostal charismatic Christianity uh, that is that originates from the U.S. But in the U.S., it's not um, it's not popular anymore. Um, the main leader the, um, was uh, Marion uh, Branham, um, and it's in Central Africa and in Asia as well that you have many Branhamist churches nowadays. But while doing research, and, and I published a chapter on their discourse about, about uh, witchcraft, technology, and connectivity in this book of which you see the cover, Pentecostalism and Witchcraft, Spiritual Warfare in Africa and Melanesia. And um, what was interesting with this group is that the Branhamist community in Kinshasa, at the time that I was doing research, they were split in one group that accepted ICT so information and communication technologies, and the other group, group that doesn't, uh, that didn't. So the Branhamist community in Kinshasa found it difficult to come to a so-called homogenous media pedagogy within their community. And um, those who were against it uh, were afraid of it. Um, and they were, in their discourses, they were constantly drawing attention to spiritual consequences that television, radio, and the internet could have and can have. Um, and so, and, and, and that, because of their attention to these spiritual consequences of um, your, you know, of what you're seeing on television, what you're hearing on the radio, the kind of information and, and then contacts that you develop on I, I argued in that paper, and here I'm quoting myself, um, that um, instead of merely thinking about mediation, we also need to pay more attention to connectivity. 
And I was writing this because in anthropology of media, the notion of mediation, especially in the anthropology of religious media, the notion of mediation has been put forward um, since I think the mid 2000s. Um, and television, radio, the Bible, prophets, you know, are all acknowledged as mediators, mediators and broker between, um, between the visible and the invisible, the material and the transcendental. Now, now, indeed, that's important. We need to pay attention to that. But what I also thought was important was actually to think about notions of personhood and then to think of, yeah, because, you know, if mediators, if they don't have people, you know, that they can bring in touch with the other invisible forces, they can't do their mediating work. You need to have, you know, people who are open to it, um, who, people who are connectable, who can be connected. So here I made then this distinction uh, between, or I made the distinction explicit. And I, I said that, you know, both mediation and connectivity emphasize interaction, it could be social, but also spiritual, and both allow room for agency, on the one hand, room for the mediators, on the other hand, room for agency of, of regular people. Now, while mediation emphasizes the in-between, the transfer of information, communication, power, value, affect, um, I think, and, and sometimes even the resolution of conflict, um, I think connectivity um, allows us to foreground something else. Connectivity allows us to attend to the, the relationships that are um, enabled, that are generated. Um, by looking at connectivity, we suddenly have to start question questioning accessibility, availability, the possibility of entering into a relationship with an other, a social or a spiritual other, and how you manage that accessibility, your accessibility towards an other, a, vis a visible social other, an invisible spiritual other maybe. And, and in Kinshasa, especially in religious discourse, you constantly hear, especially when people are warning about witchcraft um, risks, you know, people are telling, you are responsible yourself, it's not only the witch, it's you, you opened the door. So, so religious leaders constantly draw attention to their followers' responsibility um, of their own uh, positionality in the spiritual realm. They say, you open the doors, you allow the witches to come in. You allow evil powers to connect um, your soul with the occult, the demonic. Um, uh, so, so I was struck by that attention to this um, or that emphasis on accessibility, on availability. Um, and, um, and so since then, I've been starting to think about the risks of connectivity, but also the possibilities of connectivity. And what I'm presenting in this article is um, one of these, ref is the outcome of, of, is one particular outcome of these reflections. Um, and, um, and this paper talks then about undesired ways of bonding and binding. Uh, as, it may, as, it made, as it is made possible by the new ICTs, the new communication technologies. But I also think, you know, this concept of interference helps us to clarify certain social relation, uh, reactions, sorry, helps us to clarify certain social reactions on COVID-19. And for example, the, the whole discourse about the super spreaders, you know, these bodies and events uh, where you had suddenly many people being contaminated by others. Um, I think we can see these as spaces of hotspots, which will be um, a concept that uh, will be on as well. So but all in all, what I try to do in the paper that I'm presenting um, today is um, um, I think we need to uh, start teasing out what connectivity can mean to people. Um, and we need to, we need to um, start from the premise that connectivity doesn't always mean the same everywhere um, or for everybody. There is good connectivity, there is bad connectivity, there is difficult connectivity, there is smooth connectivity. I actually already saw a few times that the connection here is unstable. So I, um, I, I hope that the connectivity is good enough. Uh, we can also talk about desired connectivity, undesired connectivity. Um, and I think if you're paying attention to these different forms of 
you know, connectivity, how people qualify their ways of being accessible to others or not being accessible to others, then we get a deeper insight in contemporary forms of sociality, contemporary ways of being uh, in the world, being a social person. So um, the ethnography of the article then that I'm presenting is um, based on an outdated but still used communication device in Kinshasa and the provinces. Uh, the device is called Foni. In a few slides you'll see a picture. Well, it was on the first picture already and in, in the announcement there was a picture as well. Um, so the Foni is a, a shortwave radio uh, device. And, um, and I'm focusing on the notion of inter interference. Interference as undesired, so interference as a negative type of connectivity. Interference being an undesired interaction, an undesired way of becoming or being entangled with others. Um, and contamination and infection is obviously um, also an undesired way of being uh, connected to someone else or you know, having consequences of being connected to someone else. Um, so my analysis is embedded in uh, this new analytical space on social life and technology in Africa. And I want to mention these two books here. Um, first, The Social Life of Connectivity in Africa, edited by Miriam de Bruyne and Rick van Dijk. And then second, Transient Workspaces, um, Technologies of Everyday Innovation in Zimbabwe by uh, Klappers and Mavunga. In their introduction to the edited volume on the social life of connectivity in Africa, Miriam de Bruyne and Rijk van Dijk make a distinction between bridging on the one hand and bonding on the other hand. And they claim, and here I'm quoting them, the issue is, in the research on connectivity, the issue is whether the bridging that connections make possible lead, leads to particular or new forms of bonding. So question mark. So what I show is that we shouldn't assume that connectivity uh, always generates something new or always generates the same. Um, connectivity can produce various kinds of relationships and we need to uh, make that distinction between the relationships and the connections. Um, so they're unsettling the automatic assumption that one merely needs to connect people and then all problems are solved or people are better informed or people, or you've got democracies coming up. No, um, the connections, you know, the, the linkage between connections and relationships is not straightforward. And their statement resonates uh, with Latour's, although I don't think they quote him, their statement resonates with Latour, I don't think they quote him in that regard. Their statement resonates with Latour's musings about connectors constituting the social fabric. And I'm quoting here Latour, who says, the social is not some glue that could fix everything, including what the other glues cannot fix. Rather, the social is exactly that what is glued together by many other connectors. So if we want to study the social, then we need to study the connectors because they're doing the work of producing the social. They're doing the gluing work. It is by connectors, the gluing work of the connectors, that sociality emerges. Um, and then so connectivity or the possibility of being in with social, social, and others, then, you know, depends on connectors, which can be human and non-human. A bridge, um, which is bridging, is a connector, but um, humans can be connecting as well. I think Diego, in a sense, you know, apart from, apart from organizing the seminar, Diego is also a connector. He's organizing, you know, the material form of the seminar, but he's also inviting the people, making sure it happens. Um, connectors allow access and contact. Connectors do connecting, connecting work. And for the anthropologist, one of the tasks, if you want to study techno-sociality, um, is to look into the various categories, um, social categories that connect. And we need to ask ourselves, how do these people connect? Um, what are the qualifications of their connections? Um, what are also the relationships that are emerging after new connections are made possible 
or after old connections have been repaired maybe or been revised or slightly modified what are what what are the social uh, manifestations of interventions in these connections and in uh, the lives of the connectors and uh, for that, then I'm indebted to um, the research by Clapperton Mavunga. Um, and it's various, I would really advise everybody to read his work. Um, he's, um, he thinks out of the box. Um, so I'm only giving here one, one title, but he's published um, a lot in the recent five, six years. He's a professor of history and um, technology at MIT in Boston. And I was a postdoc for two years at the anthropology and the STS department. That's, that's where I got to know his work very well. Um, and in his book, Transient Workspaces, um, he describes the hunter. The hunter as a connector. The hunter is, many, is one of many connectors in Zimbabwean society, but hunters um, bring people together from the village with the world of animals, the world of spirits, but also the world of foreign exploiters, colonizers, the post-colonial states, but also tourists. So what Clapperton's, um, uh, how Clapperton's work inspired me was to start thinking about Kinshasa and thinking about the various kinds of connectors that are at play in Kinshasa, that are, work, that are producing the glue of quinoa sociality. And I'm using quinoa, uh, quinoa as the adjective, comes from Kinshasa. So what is, who are the connectors who are gluing Kinua society together? And then based on my fieldwork um, in these funny spaces, um, I've written this article uh, on connectivity and the funny cabin, um, but there are other papers that are coming out about connectivity and other kinds of connectors. So here you see um, already, um, Small in a small way, um, the, the device. It's an outdated communication technology. Um, it's a two way radio set, um, still used in Kinshasa today. It arrived during the colonial times. Um, and, um, and I started to ask questions like what does this connecting work that the phonique cabin does, what does it tell us about urban life? And then also, how does it help us to rethink connections between the city and the village? Because that communication device is only used to communicate with areas in the country where there is no mobile phone technology available. So Congo DRC is an enormous country. It's bigger than Europe. Um, you don't have a good uh, tran uh, transport infrastructure. Um, many, uh, the, you can't, drive from one side to the other side of the country, it's impossible. You've got um, a very thick uh, water uh, network. You have boats are probably the beating heart of the country. You've got planes, of course, um, but in, in certain areas, there's hardly any movement from the capital city or somewhere else. Um, so the state doesn't invest in tarmacking roads or making these spaces more accessible. And um, in local language, people talk about these spaces, uh, spaces as the enclave, enclaved spaces. Um, and so the mobile phone operators, they don't bother install, installing uh, telephone infrastructures in these areas either. But still people you know, wanna be in touch with their relatives in Kinshasa if they're living in these, in these uh, outdoor uh, far away spaces. And that the phony, is, um, is usually the, the only device with which they can uh, have like an immediate conversation with people far away. Um, so um, a synonym um, that is used in Kinshasa to talk about this device is alo alo. So that's, that's also what the operator usually first says when he's uh, trying to initiate a conversation is alo alo. So people also talk about the funny cabins in Kinshasa as the alo alo. So from time to time, I will be talking about the alo alo, and then I'm speaking about this, this uh, space. Um, the funny cabin, the conversations that are possible over this device are different from mobile phones. 
uh, is different from mobile phones because you've got multiple conversation partners. So you've got here the man holding the microphone who is the operator, but the man sitting next to him is actually the person who wants to have a conversation with someone far away with a distant other. And at that other distant place, you've got a similar team, an operator with a customer, with the person with whom this man needs to talk. So the funny conversations are polyphonic. Um, also, um, as I mentioned already, the direction of the funny conversations uh, go towards the village. So you never hear in Kinshasa someone saying, I want to have a funny conversation with someone on the other side of the city. No, you, then you would make a phone call. Uh, you have public phone booths as well, but many people have also mobile phones uh, that, they have, that they own or that they can use, borrow um, from someone. Um, now, um, people spent hours in these cabins sometimes um, trying to connect with colleagues in the hinterland over these systems. Um, so what is happening then with this funny infrastructure is people are bringing um, the, the life roles of people in the village present in the capital city in Kinshasa. Sounds come in, claims are made, um, and as I will say, the, the, as I will say later on, the the the, the, the funny is also very much related to trade, um, food coming in from the villages um, and being stacked um, in the depot in the compound near to the near the the funny. Um, very often, the infrastructure of the funny cabin it's pretty shabby. You will see on other pictures. Um, pretty poor, um, usually not sheltered, uh, ma mainly uh, very often a modest structure consisting of a wooden table and a bench. And which means that, you know, because it's not closed, um, passes by, cars and sounds of other conversations make the work of the operateur, the operator, very difficult at times. Um, regarding the economy of this kind of uh, infrastructure, the transmitter and the antennas um, are usually purchased by a big man, an entrepreneur who owns trucks or boats that travel between the capital city and particular villages far away from Kinshasa. And it's especially along the route of these boats and these uh, trucks that certain funny uh, cabins have been installed so that truck drivers and the captains and the patrons, although the boats also have their own funny on the boat, um, truck drivers, captains, and patrons, um, they can communicate with one another and talk about, you know, whether they've lost some, some of their goods or whether they have um, a flat tire or whether there has been a delay or a problem. So initially, the communication for the funnies is embedded in commercial enterprises. Commercial enterprises with you know, big investors in the capital city mainly, uh, and then uh, organizing trade from the interior to the city. And so the devices are actually following the route. You know, they, at certain stops, you've got the devices. But also hospitals, mission stations, and army bases, and sites of logging companies and plantations are other spaces that tend to operate funnies. Um, in certain instances, you've got village communities uh, buying the funny. A colleague of mine who does research up north in Congo in a dense area told me that people sometimes buy a pay with bush, bush meat uh, for a funny. Um, then, you know, politicians um, can also donate these devices when they're on a, on a campaigning uh, trip. Uh, in the interior of the country. NGOs also often get the request in the interior of the country to bring funis to the areas where they operate. So these two were radio systems enable conversations between Kinwa inhabitants in Kinshasa and others in places up to 2,000 and a half kilometers uh, away from Kinshasa as the crowd flies. Sorry, as the crowd flies. Um, but um, only reachable after days of traveling of roads and rivers. This communication technology is in decline. It suffers from competition with cellular companies, 
which now nearly cover the entire national territory. So it is um, still used in these areas where you don't have these cellular uh, infrastructures. Um, uh, in particular, funny agencies that have been able to transform into money transfer agencies have been able to remain in service. Uh, and you've got also new funny houses being installed um, in order to augment the possibilities of being in touch with enclaved spaces. Now, it's important to mention that this funny cabin is closely connected to the market. To, in Kinshasa, you've got more than 40 market spaces. Uh, and Kinshasa is a city of 12 million, maybe more inhabitants. Uh, the funny cabin is closely uh, connected to market spaces which is another hub where the village comes into the city. Usually the funny cabins are situated on the margins of the markets, very often in a corner of a compound abutting onto the market. And this association between commerce, market, and communication is not incidental. As I mentioned, um, it, it's, it's in that space near the markets and the funny that truck drivers unload their wares, that they take some rest, and attempt to communicate with their patrons, with their colleagues, or with their suppliers. And in most compounds where a phonie is installed, a great deal of movement also happens around buses that then, in, in the wake of the trucks, uh, transport passengers to and from the hinterland, if possible. Um, so both the phonie and the markets are intimately connected to the flow of goods, people, and information between the capital city and the village. Um, and so here just an overview of uh, a series of conversations um, that I followed. Um, uh, one, only one morning, but I spent a lot of time in these funny cabins. Um, but you, many of the visitors to these funny cabins are also on the move themselves. For like the truck driver who had arrived in Kinshasa five days later than expected and urgently needed to inform his patron about the loss of two goats and a flat tire. Or the man who came from Kinshasa, who has arrived in Kinshasa, but is originally from Bukungu, an area up north in, in the country, and his mission had been to sell fish, but he had seen his stay extended, uh, endlessly extended because of lack of funds to take the boat back and desperately wanted to know how the illness of his daughter was progressing. Other Alo Alo customers set up home in Kinshasa, like the two elderly sisters who needed to send money, 40,000 Congolese friends, francs at the time, approximately 35 US dollars. They had to send it to distant relatives for a funeral of one of their class of Vitry uncles. Or that young woman whose father had stayed with her for a few months in Kinshasa, but then had returned to Oshui in the Mayindombe province, also up north, and, was, and that young woman was called to the funi to listen to her father, who wanted to give his opinion about her, uh, her marriage. And all she could say was, Nazolanda, I'm following, I'm listening to what you're saying. Now, the ethnography of listening to these conversations has um, forced me to, or enabled me, to think about agents of connectivity a, and how agents of connectivity populate the quinoa sociality. Um, and in the Funi Cabin, um, or my ethnography of Funi Cabin uh, sociality, um, has drawn my attention to a configuration of four particular agents. So the funny operator, but also the ndumba, an unmarried sexually active girl, sometimes also prostitute, although you cannot reduce the ndumba to a prostitute. The ndoki, sorcerer or witch, difficult, it's, it's well, both actually, and then the truck driver. Um, and all, all these, there, there are four types, there are four agents of connectivity, but actually four agents of interference. What they, what they are bringing together is a kind of risk and a kind of danger. Um, but maybe some words about interference. Interference obviously draws from you know, the technical uh, sphere and primarily refers to the um, incongruity of radiophonic communication with electricity. Um, the phony um, devices operate better when there's no electricity or when there is rain, um, when there's rain or too much wind, 
the conversations are also difficult. But when there's electricity, you literally hear this interference. You know, you, you've heard before, like, the, 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 so it makes uh, the conversations very difficult. So uh, the phonies operate um, without electricity, otherwise there is interference. Um, but interference is a concept that in social sciences um, has also gained some purchase. Um, and uh, the philosopher Michel Serres um, has already in the early 80s talked about noise and interference. Um, and he, he, drew, he drew attention to um, how cities, urban spaces, actually depend on noise. In his book, he, he starts his reflection with um, why mice and rats are important in the city. You know, they're, they're producing a particular kind of noise, metaphorical, metonymic noise as well. Um, so, so he was bringing attention to the productive quality, the productive possibilities of noise. Um, Brian Larkin, who many of us probably know, uh, an anthropologist of media, um, has then in 2008 published this, this, this major book, Signal and Noise, based on his ethnography um, in, in northern Nigeria, and has asked for more attention to what he calls the metonym, metonymic and metaphorical meanings of degrading and degraded material infrastructure. And he, and here I'm quoting him, he argued that, um, that there is a particular sensorial experience of media that comes because of poor transmission, interference, and noise, end of quote. And just think about the annoyance that he might have felt when my connection now was unstable. Um, so there is this sensorial experience of frustration, of being annoyed. Um, and, and Larkin says, this experience actually is, is significant and it bears a lot of material um, meaning and also political meaning. And we need to acknowledge that. Um, he talks about the semiotics of distortion. Blurred images and distorted sounds constitute a semiotics of distortion. And this uh, semiotics of distortion uh, signals, according to Larkin, a technological marginalization, a technological marginalization which is intimately tied to an uneven access um, to economic and political worlds. A few years earlier, he had co-authored this book on media worlds, anthropology, anthropology on New Terrain, in which together with Lala Bulugat and Faye Ginsburg, um, they've talked about the semiotics of interference. Uh, for example, if you're sitting in a cinema and someone walks in front of it, then you, you've got shadows in front of the screen. Um, but also, you know, hot temperature when you're in crowded cinemas um, or when the sound suddenly drops. Um, the, the, these are, um, these produce semiotics of interference. And here I'm quoting Abu Loga, Ginsburg and Larkin, um, who say these semiotics of interference um, represent a process of meaningful communication. And in that process of meaningful communication, the physical qualities of the media threaten to overwhelm the message itself, but we should not ignore that experience. We need to understand how unwanted, undesired, and or un interfering sounds and images and people contribute to this experience. And so I've, I've been drawing on Larkin's and then Abel Lugard, Ginsburg and Larkin's and Sarah's insights on this interference and this productive way of, um, of interference. And I thought, well, there is something, you know, plainly uh, interfering in social life going on as well, of course. Um, you know, we all, we all, we're all familiar with, you know, being annoyed by if someone suddenly meddles uh, in, your, in, in your life, uh, uh, suddenly, you know, wants to uh, give his or her an opinion with, about something which you never asked, with some, when someone is intruding in your private space. These all are examples of interference as a social practice. And then focusing on interference as a social practice then can help drawing our attention to the undesired effects of social connectivity, to the undesired effects of being accessible or available 
to engage with others, to be entangled with others. And um, the reason why um, I'm thinking about interference in this context of this ethnography is actually because that was the mood of many people, of actually most people going to the Phoenix cabin in Kinshasa. Um, they, they, they were afraid, they, had, they, they experienced some anxiety, but they also experienced pressure because if you get a call notification to go to a Funi house, if you're living in Kinshasa, you're a resident in Kinshasa, and you get a call notification to go and visit the Funi the next day, for example, at 10 a.m., it means bad news is coming. It means someone in the village might have died, is critically ill, needs money, or there are other, there are other stuff for which you need to send money. So people, you know, there would not be any anticipation or joy if you are called to the um, to the uh, to the funi, actually, there is an interference of the village that is, you know, announcing that is going on. So, based on that, um, I, I I I I started asking questions like, um, what are the social and techn technical layers of interference in Kinshasa's funi cabins? I need to change the um, uh, slides. Yeah. What are the social and technical layers of interference in Kinshasa's funi cabins? How is this interference managed, if at all? And what can you learn from it about urban sociality and life in an interconnected world? And then finally, more abstractly, what does an analytical focus on interference inform us about a dialogue of electronically mediated connectivity with other forms of social connectedness, cohabitation and coexistence? So here, this, the value of this picture is that I'm showing this, this antennae uh, in a compound where there's a funi. So uh, the article also develops a heuristic argument regarding the life of connectivity. And I, I, I built further on an article that I co-authored with Richard Vokes on um, uh, media on the move. Um, ethnographies of communication, connectivity, and sub-Saharan Africa. And um, there we've developed the notion of media chronotopes, um, which um, is an analytic concept that allows us to attend to the interactions between temporalities and the experience of place, as these are mediated by electronic media. A hotspot is a particular kind of chronotope. The, fun the funi cabin is a hotspot. Hotspots are spaces of excess of meaning, spaces of excess of affects, and spaces of excess of flows. The hotspot then provides an excellent entry into this ethnography of contemporary modernity, and especially electronic modernity. After all, information and communication technologies assemble words, people, their individual and shared histories, their expectations, and their imagined futures. But funny cabins is one particular type of a hotspot. There are other hotspots that we can identify as well. Bars, markets, public phone booths, um, but also, for example, the body of a prostitute. These are spaces of congregation and flow. They are, by definition, spaces of connection and disconnection. And I think it's to these dynamics of creating, sustaining, and managing relations with others via speech and technology, and their embodied and immaterial interactions with various forms of placemaking that we need to be attentive to in order to understand how nowadays social persons or selves are entangled. And I'm making this concrete um, by talking about the FUNI operator as a connector. And here I'm also giving you um, a, 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 um, a, um, a map um, and the red circle shows the area where you've got most of the phonies of one particular phony circuit um, with which that operator, uh, which you see here, sitting in Kinshasa, is usually communicating. So that area is part of the circuit Tevans, T20, and you've got four phonies in Kinshasa, and then in these other spaces mentioned there, you've got a phony operator. So that's like the circuit. And uh, on the next slide, you've got another circuit. You know, you've got Kinshasa to the left, 
but the Longomba phony um, communicates mainly with phonies installed in that red area in the middle of the country. Now, why is the operator a connector? He enables conversations between the city and the village. Sometimes he translates and sometimes even speaks on behalf of others. So he is, I'll come back for later to the connector, but he's first and foremost a broker, a mediator. A broker who knows perfectly how to balance between speaking and listening. At certain times, the operator, you know, after he has given the microphone to his uh, visitor or client, he might take over the microphone again. And in my article, I describe such a scene. But also others tend to interrupt the conversation. You see others already sitting here. These are children um, or young people, uh, but in other instances, they're elderly people. And everybody is constantly commenting, giving feedback on how to speak well towards the village. There is a constant collective deliberation of the management of funny speech. And this collective deliberation about the management of funny speech has a deep meaning, uh, which relates to socio-spiritual powers of public speech, uh, as described in ethnographies of rural life in the DRC and DR Congo. Uh, one of my former professors, Renard de Vich, uh, wrote this wonderful book, Weaving the Threads of Life, in which he talks about this mystical flow, enabled uh, or traveling through words. Words enable socio-spiritual operations of words. These words can produce, but they can also jeopardize sociality. As in the Funi cabins, languages related to the ethnic groups are spoken, so in Kinshasa, people you know, the lingua franca of Kinshasa is Lingala, and it's street slang, Kikinwa, but also French. But in these funny cabins, people will mainly speak the languages of the areas where, with which they are communicating. So you've got, um, you've got a lot of other languages that are being spoken in the funny cabins. And the language has this mystical quality of making that connection with the ethnic group. Um, and so, because of that mystical quality, the Funi cabin becomes something very important, something very fundamental. It is um, a space in which the life flow can travel. It's a space in which the membership of the clients, but their membership in a particular ethnic community is at stake. This life force links members to their particular ethnic community language contributes to their uh, mystical participation in their uh, ethnic community and then and by consequence um, it also determines one's material and spiritual health. So Funi houses become crucial spaces for the future of the ethnic group and its members. And here it's important to dwell on the responsibility of the operator. operator. The operator is not only a mediator <coughs> in the sense that he transforms, translates, distorts sometimes, or modifies the meanings of elements being carried, but he's also a connector in the Latourian reading of key figures in social networks. For Latour, connectors make possible the transportation of agencies for great distance. Now the operators, as enablers of long distance communication to the village, the operator is important in the maintenance or the consolidation of social order. He's also important as to the quality of the lines running between city and village. Thus, Allo Allo or Funny Technology acquires a generative force in the cabin through the appropriate, appropriate use of language, ethnic society can be generated. Now, the operator is first and foremost the enabler of the transmission of the flow of life. Apart from words, affect and life flow, as I said, are transferred. So we can argue that the phony operator protects the fragility of the life flow, which due to the distance becomes even more delicate, fragile. Given that visual markers such as bodily posture, facial expression, dress code and gestures are not easily communicable along the phony lines, and that language transports not only messages, but mystical life forces as well, a funny conversation is risky for the future of the group. 
when the life flow depends entirely on the acoustic. It is therefore not at all surprising that there's a great deal of meta talk about the funny conversations in the cabins as well. And these observations about the role of speech and the social reproduction of the lineage help me to explain better the fear and pressure experienced in and around the funny cabin. And they also explain why the operator feels responsible to intervene when a conversation threatens to go wrong. Now, strikingly, as I said, this sense of responsibility is shared by the other customers who likewise feel entitled to commend advice and correct speech style, word choice, tonality, and interactivity. As you can see in the pictures, uh, you have always other people around. Some just do some hanging out. Others have accompanied someone who had received a full call notification, while still others are customers themselves waiting for their turn to communicate with someone far away. Um, so given this important role to the operator, it's not surprising then that some of these, some of my interlocutors compare the role of an operator with that of a diviner or with that of a military person. And these references to the role of healing, but also the world of protection, speak to power and authority. As a connector, the operator sets forth effective material, economic, and spiritual exchanges between the village and the city. Now, this, is, this, this, uh, this experience of interference is, uh, is unique, is recent. Um, in the 1990s, funny cabins were spaces of joy, of celebration and anticipation, because during that time, most of the funny conversations were with air people residing in areas in Angola, northern Angola, or elsewhere in the country where people were engaged in the diamond trade. So then usually when you were in Kinshasa and you get a phony call, then actually there would be this kind of expectation that money was going to be sent uh, from North Angola or from the interior, or that there was good news um, to be called. Um, so, so this combination of affect uh, and the phony, uh, the interference, is a recent experience. It's recent and it's related to the recent economy. Catherine, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to interfere. You have a yeah. couple of minutes to wrap up. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. So, and indeed, so this is like uh, my penultimate slide, actually. Um, so, um, the, operator, the operator is only one of the many connectors of populating Kinshasa's uh, social universe. So to conclude, I want to situate the operator among other agents of interference that I came across during uh, the fieldwork in the Funi cabins. Um, and as I mentioned already, those three characters, the Ndumba, the Ndoki, and the Poro, what they have in common is that they literally all four bring different worlds together. They connect individuals, goods, ideas, and affect. We do this by interfering, intruding, and installing risk and danger. So the first one is the, uh, the Ndumba, which you know, is best to translate as a, sex, as a free girl you know, who is sex, sexually active. Some prefer to um, translate it as, um, as a prostitute. She's a significant urban connector. How does she pop up here in this fieldwork? Actually, the language being used to talk about the radio waves reference urban sexuality. For example, um, the, the, main, the main wave on which the circuits you know, communicates, it's called the boulevard, and that's the space where the prostitutes find their clients. When an operator doesn't have any clients, he can you know, change the frequency, go from one frequency to the others while whistling. That whistling and that looking for clients in villages is called in Lingala, doing prostitution. And then when you have a conversation, for example, I'm in Kinshasa, Diego is in a village, and we're at the, same, we're at the appointed moment uh, in our funny houses, then in or so we're first meeting on the boulevard on the main frequency of that radio the, uh, the circuit but in or but then everybody else on the circuit can hear the conversation so um in order to have this kind of intimacy um then the two operators 
will decide on a more intimate um, frequency uh, on which the conversation will continue. And that in Lingala is called Kokota na Chambre, which is also, which means to enter into the Chambre room, um, and which is the space of sexual activity. So the Ndumba, um, the Ndumba came uh, in my field, interfered in my field work as this, this, this character, this protagonist by which um, the, the, the oppressionality of the, uh, of the device um, is, is explained or is, um, uh, yeah, is explained. But there's another layer to it. Um, the Numba herself is an agent of interference, of unwanted involvement, because as an outsider, she is an intruder in the husband-wife unit. When exchanging her body for money or commodities with married or otherwise committed men, the Ndumba connects. She establishes a linkage between her lovers, between herself, her lovers, and their wives, and between all these individuals and their own former, present, and future sexual partners. There's an invisible yet intricate and very intimate network of bodies, banknotes, and words thrives around flirtation, seduction, and sexuality. Regarding um, the, that's my final slide. Regarding witchcraft, as I said, um, the, the phony um, doesn't operate well when there is electricity. So sometimes there are rumors that phony operators deliberately switch off the electricity and put the, um, the compound in which the phony is installed um, off grid, um, which people in Kinshasa don't like. So uh, constantly you would then hear these kinds of accusations. Ah, oh, you're a witch. You don't want us to have electricity. Or when the electricity, you know, suddenly switches off, you have a, a power cut, the operator is usually happy um, while the others are unhappy because of this lack of electricity. So that kind of joy, antisocial joy, is, is actually a mirroring of, you know, witches' antisocial behavior. Um, in discourse about witchcraft as well, antennae appear as metaphors to explain how witches operate. It is said that witches install antennae, invisible antennae in households, and that's how they hear about problems, conflicts in households. So, and, and witches, of course, they make connections between, uh, invisible connections. They set up invisible lines between their victims um, and, and evil powers. And finally, the truck drivers, as I said, funny houses are intimately tied to the market um, and to the truck drivers. The truck drivers make connections between the city and the villages where they're passing. And in Kinshasa, but in various other um, regions in Africa, truck drivers are uh, perceived to be dangerous because of, you know, they're wandering off in these unknown spaces. They are like the hunters um, of the village, but in contrast to the hunter who has a good positive moral connotation because the hunter brings meat back to the village um, and, you know, doesn't wander off for days. Truck drivers, they spend sometimes weeks away. People don't know what they're doing out there and these elsers. So you've got a lot of mystification going on in Kinshasa about truck drivers, about their risky contacts, contacts elsewhere. And they are just like prostitutes and witches and operators uh, perceived as agents of interference. They're, um, they're bringing together, they're connecting dangerous worlds. So what I've tried to do here was I tried to qualify connectivity I try to show that as anthropologists or social scientists, we should not take connectivity for granted, but we should um, think about the different kinds of connectivity that are possible and how people qualify connectivity in various ways and how people manage their um, connectivity. What is at stake when connectivity is managed? Who are the ones who are expected to manage connectivity? And the case study has drawn attention to one particular type of connectivity being inter uh, interference, um, a negative form of connectivity, which in this case was also intimately tied to a particular communication device. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to, um, to the discussion.